Here's what's coming up on episode 94 of the Big Seance Podcast. Ashley Riley. I found that I just had a very natural gift for understanding really complex metaphysical concepts and explaining them to people in ways that they could understand. And also just a a real gift for helping people kind of navigate their own personal circumstances in, in whatever challenges they were experiencing. I use dream interpretation to kind of poke around in your subconscious and see what's really going on, what you're not aware of. All of those things pop up in your dreams. I use tarot to give me an idea of what is blocking you or keeping you from recognizing these things and moving past them. I use numerology to give me an idea of what your soul path was before you incarnated here. It involved Godzilla, Jason Priestley, and a flying vacuum cleaner. (laughs) That reminds me of the dream that I had uh, where the dinosaur was ice skating, doing figure eights on the Oregon coast to a song that I composed in my dream in my head. (laughs) Yeah, that was a weird one, too. Welcome to the Big Seance Podcast. I'm Patrick Keller of BigSeance.com, and this is a place for an open discussion on all things paranormal, but specifically topics like ghosts and hauntings, paranormal research, spirit communication, psychics and mediums, and life after death. So basically, anything that pops up in my paranormal world. The candles are already lit, so you might as well come on in and join the seance. I know that some of you love to talk about dreams and the meaning of them. In today's interview with my friend Ashley Riley, we're going to get our dream on. And our paranerd friend Natalia is even going to have the opportunity to have a very interesting dream interpreted. After the interview, Tim Prossel will be back with another spectral edition And you'll want to be sure to catch the Paranerd hashtag at the end of the show. I have a feeling some of you don't know about the Paranerd hashtag and the surprises that I sometimes leave you with. See what happens when you don't listen all the way to the end? (laughs) For real, though, there'll be a Paranerd hashtag at the end of the show. Well, pour your tea and get comfy. In the parlor with me today is Ashley Riley. She's a multimedia psychic intuitive with a very specific skill set. She taps into your energy field to locate various blockages, be it a limited belief about yourself, a traumatic event, a bad relationship that caused a negative view of self, and then she brings that emotional energy forward into your awareness for acknowledgement and hold an energetic space for you to begin the healing process. Some of her work involves numerology, dream interpretation, tarot, and long-distance energy work. Now, today, we're going to primarily be talking about Ashley's work with dreams, but I definitely want to hit on all things Ashley today. Her amazing website that you should check out is inmysacredspace.com. Hi, Ashley. Hi. Welcome to the Big Seance Podcast. We're a bunch of nerds here. I'm so happy to be here, but you know that I've been following your blog for since its inception, pretty much, and uh, the podcast too, so... First time actually being on it. Yeah, and we we already talked earlier that we've known each other for uh, like five years now, and we're um, almost neighbors. We don't live far from each other here in the St. Louis area, and this is the first time I've seen like a moving version of your face and heard your voice. Yeah, isn't that weird? So weird. I just had a I just had a flash of um what's the Austin Powers movie with um 
John Travolta in it, and he's like, isn't that weird? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I know that movie. Clearly, I need to see it. I think it's the uh, the third one. It has <laughs> Tom Cruise in it and John Travolta at the very end. We're in the Austin Powers movie as you're watching it in the theater. But yeah. I have some homework to do. Well, we pour each guest a special drink here when they come into the parlor. So what can I get you today? Anything caffeinated. You know, I'm a coffee addict. Okay. Coffee. I've finished my coffee. I can't even say that I'm drinking coffee because I it's straight up gone. So here's some backstory on Ashley and I, and, and she just she just kind of introduced you to a little bit of that. But when I first started blogging in 2012, I had really, I had no idea what I was doing, but I was soaking up any knowledge that I could get, not only on just spiritual paranormal topics, but about blogging in general and, and kind of how to do it in websites and I jumped into it all full blast. And I don't remember exactly how our paths crossed, but Ashley gave me lots of advice about blogging and about how to network. I also remember being fascinated by her spiritual growth and her story. And she had a lot of spiritual knowledge to give. And she had this beautiful blog called In My Sacred Space which I mentioned earlier, and it's since turned into so much more than a blog. And again, this site is in my sacred space.com makes sense, right? So that's kind of the background, by the way, we just talked for like an hour before we jumped into this. Uh, we should do this more often, have Skype dates more often. <laughs> so Ashley, to give the listeners a little taste of just how real you are. I want to read something from your site and I'm going to end up bleeping myself, but I love it. And my, my kids will get a kick out of this. I'm sure. So Ashley on her site, which you could stay on all day long and never run out of information. She says, I'm Ashley, your intuitive personal development mentor. I help my clients uncover the self-defeating beliefs that are blocking their path to true happiness, provide a safe space in which they can heal and mentor them on intuitively navigating the life ahead. This is your opportunity to own your shit, take back control of your life, and get in alignment with your higher self. And then she says, are you ready to kick some ass? <laughs> I love it. That's how real you are, Ashley. I think that's cool. I'm actually shocked you didn't pick something that had an F-bomb in it. Oh, so there's F-bombs on there, too. Oh, you should see oh, my some of my your blog letter. content. <laughs> on some of my blog content, but even in my welcome letter, when people subscribe to my blog, the, the very end of it says, and by the way, I like to say F a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I really do. Well, I've already blabbed too much. So in your own words, can you give us uh, just a little about your story, your your journey and what it is you do at In My Sacred Space? So, you know, I've I've got a lot of um, background informa information about myself on the blog, but you know, I've, I've really always been intuitive. I know I feel like that's the cliche thing for every psychic to say is, well, I've had this gift since birth. Um, I, I, on the other hand, never really truly recognized it for what it was until much, much, much later in life. You know, when I was a kid, I had experiences with spirits. I just knew things that I should not have known and had a lot of really odd paranormal experiences that stuck with me throughout my life. And I was raised in a very Christian household. And, you know, in, in terms of that, spirits didn't exist. That was demons from hell, or it was just a bad dream. And, you know, you didn't, you didn't see these things. You didn't feel these things. And so for a long time, I really just kind of forgot about it and, you know, threw my hands up and shrugged and moved on with life. And then um, a few years later, I started to uh, have more paranormal experiences again. And um, I actually had moved in with a roommate who was into paranormal investigation and she kind of reintroduced me to uh, metaphysics and um, 
spirit. And, you know, we used to sit in our basement and watch Ghost Hunters. It was our favorite show (laughs) that we would watch together all the time. And she would go on investigations and bring back the audio and we would listen to things. And um, when I was living with her, I started to experience activity again. And so I didn't really know what to do with it at the time. Um, And then I started doing a little more research and, and it really sort of happened by happenstance um, that I came across a couple of spiritual blogs and started reading about them. And the experiences that people were talking about there were things that I completely resonated with and things that I'd experienced. And I was like, oh my God, I didn't know anybody else had ever experienced something like this or, or thought this way. So that's really kind of what got me into spirituality. And as I, as I started learning more, I found that I just had a very natural gift for understanding really complex metaphysical concepts and explaining them to people in ways that they could understand. And also just a, a real gift for helping people kind of navigate their own personal circumstances in, in whatever challenges they were experiencing. And it, it was sort of through that just talking to random people in various Facebook groups that kind of spurred me to start my own blog. And initially it was it was going to be a lifestyle blog and I wanted to talk about all the ways that you can incorporate spirituality into your daily life whether it's, you know, from conscious living, um being more aware of the environment and how that relates to your spirituality or metaphysical topics, um paranormal experiences kind of the whole gamut. And what I quickly found was that I focused way more on the spiritual aspect uh, and the metaphysical aspect than any of the other areas. And so that's kind of where the focus went. And then around, I, over this time period, I've had the blog since 2014. And so over that time period, I, I started learning tarot and I started learning numerology and, and various other types of divination and psychic tools. So last summer, I decided I was going to start offering single card tarot readings, um, sort of as a one-off thing on my site. And um, because I, I still worked a full-time job, so I didn't, I didn't have a whole lot of time to dedicate to it, but I wanted to really kind of get into that. And then um, last December, I decided that I really wanted to start figuring out a bigger way for me to to help people and bring this stuff into um, sort of the mainstream and and their awareness. So that's when I decided that I was going to start offering um, personal development mentorship program. And, um, also I had this idea for a dream interpretation course. And, and part of the reason for that was just because I have always been an extremely vivid dreamer. And a lot of my, my paranormal experiences have involved dreams and I've used dream interpretation over the last few years as a way of increasing my own intuition as a way to really get to the bottom of certain uh, issues that I'm experiencing and um, as a way to kind of know what's coming in my life path and a way to navigate it. You can connect with spirit guides and past lives through dreams. There's just so much that can be done with it. And so I really wanted to use what I know and teach people how to use this as a tool in their daily lives to help them kind of navigate their own path. And it's, and it's cool. You, your website and your content, it can't be put in a box, really everything that's on your site because you, uh, there's so much on there, you know, there's personal development. You talk about healing, um, manifesting, you mentioned past lives, psychic abilities, meditation, relationships, health. And then I also thought it was interesting. You mentioned the conscious living, which even has, you know, home and garden stuff and, and DIY things on there kind of for the more spiritually minded. Yeah. Cause I feel like anything that you do, I mean, the whole reason that we're here in this existence is, 
spirituality, basically, you know, it's to develop spiritually and have a spiritual experience. So everything that we surround ourselves with in some way can have a spiritual connection to us and can be sort of a physical manifestation of our own spirituality. And so that's why I really like to show people how there is a connection there. But for real, guys, she's also just an amazing web designer, too. And her site, you can tell that there is not one thing that she's missed on this site. It is beautiful. And it's it's I remember it being beautiful way back when you started it. So you should definitely check out in my sacred space. But I have a question. I was embarrassed to tell you earlier that I uh, hadn't checked out your site in a long time. And it's it's grown so much since the time of it just purely being a blog um, with with all of the the knowledge that you have and the things that you offer on there. What's the difference between that and like a life coach, like life coaching? Or is it similar? Is it the same? How does it differ? You know, so it's interesting you ask that because when I first started getting into this, that's one of the things that I researched was, you know, what exactly does a life coach do versus I I wanted to call myself an intuitive counselor. Um, Unfortunately, legally speaking, you can't do that because you have to have a counseling degree. Um, Life coaches, on the other hand, don't. And so I I found a website that explained sort of the difference between the two. And it was basically that a a counselor or a therapist helps you look into the past to understand what happened and how it affected you. Whereas a life coach works with you in the present and how to move forward with life goals and things like that. So a counselor would work more with the emotional aspect, whereas the life coach would say, okay, okay we're going to create some goals around these certain things and I'm going to help you achieve those goals. Um, The life coach doesn't necessarily really dig into the um, therapeutic aspect of why you need a life coach in the first place. They have sort of an outside in approach with me. It's, it's sort of a combination of all of those things I use dream interpretation to kind of poke around in your subconscious and see what's really going on, what you're not aware of, um, because all all of those things pop up in your dreams. I use tarot to give me an idea of what is blocking you or keeping you from recognizing these things and moving past them. I use numerology to give me an idea of what your soul path was before you incarnated here. Um, And that will give me sort of an overview of the challenges and the experiences that you wanted to have. And then when I pull all of those things together, I can get a really clear sort of picture of what's going on, even if you're not aware of it. And we can really bring that into your own awareness and then start to create sort of that life coachy okay, here's what we need to work on. Here's what you can do. This is your homework. I want you to go home and do this and start implementing these things into your life. So I'm sort of a hybrid between those two things with a little bit of psychic thrown in the middle. <laughs> well, no, it, it's good. It gives people options for things that they, they resonate with. You know, so you're, you're clearly, I mean, if someone finds your site, you're going to find those people that are, are going to, I keep saying resonates like my word lately, but they're going to resonate with the divination tools and being open to things like that. So that's cool. So when you work with someone and you say you incorporate the, the dream work and not everybody remembers their dreams, I know that's probably something that you hear often. I, it's something I've always said too. I don't remember my dreams often when I do, they're really crazy, but (laughs) so do you say, okay, you know, we need you to have some dreams first. So go home and dream. (laughs) How do you, how does, how does that start? And do, uh, do you give them tips on having the dreams and, and documenting the dreams? How's that begin? Yeah. So the interesting thing is I I took a poll once in a, a Facebook group of how many people remember their dreams and how many people didn't. Vast majority of women said that they did. Most of the people who said they didn't were men. Wow. I, I don't, know why that is. I've not found any kind of scientific evidence to explain it. 
um, or if there's even been any studies done on that. But I thought that was an interesting thing. Second thing, I want to clear this up, and I talk about this in my course. It's not that you don't dream. It's just that you don't remember them. Everybody dreams every night. The reason why you don't remember them, though, is because of the, of the sleep state that you're in when you're having the dream. So you're most often, most likely to remember your dreams when you're in the REM state, REM. And you are most likely to remember them when you wake up immediately afterward. And that's because the dream sticks around in your short-term memory and you're more likely to commit it to a longer-term memory. So what happens is when you are the type of person who doesn't get a lot of REM sleep and you stay more in sort of this very deep um, delta state, you are still dreaming, but because your, your consciousness is so deeply in this state, your brain waves are literally almost flatlining, you don't remember them. So basically, if you're sleeping really well, is that yeah, what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. So people who are deep sleepers are more likely to not remember their dreams. And there are ways that and tactics that I, I also give in my course that will help you kind of circumvent that. You can set an alarm for the middle of the night. So your sleep cycles are pretty, pretty regular. So you can figure out when you're most likely to be having dreams and like set your alarm for like three in the morning. And as soon as it wakes you up, try to remember what was going on in your mind. So I have a whole list of things that um, tips and tricks that I give people to start really conditioning themselves to remember um, what's going on in their head while they're asleep at night. But really also just thinking about it too, right? Like I, this reminds me of uh, when I, one of the very, I, I've said this many times the last several episodes, but one of the very first nerdy books that I read when I began to get into this stuff was on astral travel, which is a little deep to jump into one of the first books, you know, and yeah. just reading about it, not even trying any of the exercises or anything like that. I was having dreams all over the place just because I was yeah. reading about that stuff. And like you said, wait, setting your alarm to wake up. So and I have that experience. I can tell you that works. Just thinking about it and telling yourself you're going to remember your dream or Absolutely. saying, wake up so I can feel the dream or feel the dream. Remember the dream and it works. And that's the first thing that I tell people is it's literally you're just setting an intention. Before you go to sleep at night, start telling yourself, I'm going to remember my dreams. And a lot of times that's all it takes. You know, do that two or three nights in a row and then see what happens. And you start to train your brain to remember those things. Like, I'm not even kidding. I'm at the point now where I start interpreting my dreams while I'm still in them. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> and I'll, I'll wake up and immediately just be repeating this dream in my head so that I don't forget any of the symbolism. And it just it's an automatic thing. You were talking about um, having paranormal dreams or dreams that, you know, had spiritual meaning or or a deeper meaning. How are we to know which ones are just our brain kind of resetting itself after a crazy day or, you know, reviewing all the events of our life? And how are we to know which ones, you know, are maybe, I don't know, a spirit visit or or a, a guide kind of giving you a download of of things that you might need? So the whole your brain is just processing information uh, mindset is sort of the scientific view of dreams at mm. this point. And I will say to very often, what I find is that your brain will pull recent events. So like you might have done something yesterday or last week and then it shows up in a dream, right? But what happens is that that's just the freshest symbol that's in your your mind. And so your mind will pull that symbol and use it to reflect something back to you. So just because it's using a symbol that was something that occurred in recent waking life doesn't mean that it's just your brain processing information. It, it, your, your brain is, give your brain a little more credit than that. You know, it's going to pull all of these things from your mind. It could be something from your past, from your present, and filter it back to you in a symbolic way. So 
being able to recognize what different things mean within a dream, you know, that you have a multidimensional consciousness and there are different levels of consciousness that um, they all exist simultaneously. And you have certain types of dream symbolism that can be identified with different levels of that consciousness. And what you end up finding is that a lot of times those things get layered in there together. So it can be a little more difficult to say, well, this was just a past life dream or this was just, you know, this kind of dream. Um, A lot of times it doesn't necessarily work that way. So there's super conscious dreaming and there's subconscious dreaming. And uh, subconscious dreaming tends to be sort of that symbolism that is something that came from your waking life that day that's being regurgitated back to you. Typically, it's reflecting emotions that you perhaps felt during the day or emotions that you felt but didn't express during the day. Superconscious dreams is where all the cool shit happens. Superconscious dreaming is where you're meeting your guides, you're meeting people in the astral plane, you're talking to a deceased loved one. And and that kind of dream tends to be, there are different things that you can recognize each type, but a lot of times they seem to be very, very vivid. You will remember them, you'll wake up and you'll be like, holy shit, how about that dream? Um you will feel like it's really happening or that it's really, this person is really there. They tend to come with really, really strong emotional energy attached to them. They sort of linger in your mind when you wake up past life dreams, especially I like to call it the past life dream hangover because when I wake up in the morning from a past life dream, there's a lot of really thick emotional energy that is floating to the surface from that life. And I just, I, I can't shake that dream for the rest of the day. Um, I have an entire checklist in the course itself that gives you different things to look at to try to identify which pieces of your dream are attached to what. Um, so there's a lot of helpful material for that, too. That's fascinating. Do you know the hue technique, the say hue to remember your dreams? technique? No, I've heard that and I feel like I know it, but it's not coming to mind at the moment. It's just the word, right? Hue? Yeah, just saying, and I I don't know if you're supposed to really hold out the hue or it's it is so weird, but I uh, I remember I saw a book about it or something years ago and blogged about it and I did it a few times. Tried it, I remember, for two or three nights and I think I did end up having a few funky dreams and I'm just like, that is freaking weird. I think that's probably like a, a vibrational thing. You know, when you have certain chants and mantras that mm-hmm. different monks do for various types of things, you know, Om, for example, it's a certain vibrational frequency. I would assume that Hue has a specific vibrational frequency that sort of sets your brain. I didn't think about it in those terms. That's interesting. Those are the terms that I think in all the time. <laughs> By far, the most popular post at BigSeance.com has always been a post about being able to read in your dreams. And I didn't think about adding that question to this interview until now. Have you had experiences of reading in your dreams or do you know about that? Oh, God, I read in my dreams all the time. Yeah. Do you think it has a particular meaning or is it just an ability that someone has when they start reading in the dreams? Um, I think it's just a a symbol as anything else. A lot of times I will see words. Sometimes I'll hear words, but I I often remember like seeing signs with words on them or or things like that. Me too. I'm pretty sure I commented on that post and told you that it reminded me of an episode of the Batman cartoon show (laughs) where the scarecrow put Batman to sleep and the way that Batman knew he was sleeping and dreaming was because you weren't supposed to be able to read in dreams and he couldn't read any of the newspapers. <laughs> I remember you having a crazy, insane uh, follow-up to that post, didn't it? And you also have some kind of dream, of some crazy celebrity or something. There's some other comment that I remember you giving me feedback about some dream you had about some celebrity or something that was just, I remember, almost peeing. When I oh god, it, it's that. probably the one recurring, like true recurring dream that I ever remember having. 
was when I was a kid. It might have been, God, I don't know if I was a teenager or not, but a, a recurring dream. So typically a, a standard recurring dream is when you have the exact same dream more than once. Now, there are other recurrent recurring dreams where you will have the same dream, but like certain elements will change. So it's not the exact same dream. But this this one was the exact same dream. I had it twice within a really short period of time. And it was in black and white. It involved Godzilla, Jason Priestley, and a flying vacuum cleaner. <laughs> I bet that was it. That had to have been it. <laughs> And no, I have not even remotely attempted to interpret that dream. <laughs> that reminds me of the dream that I had uh, where the dinosaur was on ice skates, ice skating, doing figure eights on the coast, like on the Oregon coast, to a song that I composed in my dream, in my head. <laughs> yeah. That was a weird one, too. <laughs> So, uh, and you you helped me with this one because this is totally not a question that would just pop in my brain, but we're going to get deep here. So, um, how are dreams related to Jungian archetypes and the tarot? So, Jung did a lot of... Re Jung was an esoteric motherfucker, okay? <laughs> and... So he did a lot of research into various world religions. And what he found was that a lot of these religious stories were telling the same stories over and over and over with the same characters and the same storylines and the same challenges. And what he did is he rolled all of that information up and categorized it into what he called archetypes. And, and in his mind, these archetypes existed sort of in the collective consciousness and every person their subconscious mind sort of rolls up into the collective consciousness and we experience these archetypes throughout our lives they're very they're just common themes and you know a, another way to think of it is if we were living in a virtual reality and each of us was a, a program archetypes would be sort of like the the source code where all of these different programs are playing out. And I, I have my friend October to thank for that analogy. So I just need to throw that in there. <laughs> I think I know this October. Yeah, you do. And so with the archetypes, what Jung did was pulled all of these dream symbols from common dreams that people have, and he associated them back to the archetypes. And so you'll see these same archetypal stories playing out in your dreams. You'll see these same archetypes appear on cards in the tarot. Joseph Campbell is a, a famed mythologist, and he did a lot of work with archetypes as well. And one of the things that he talks about a great deal is the hero's journey. Um, you'll find tons and tons of really cool videos on YouTube of Joseph Campbell giving examples of the hero's journey in movies like Star Wars or The Matrix. And he points out every every archetype that's occurring there. Um, but that's the same thing as the fool's journey through the major arcana of the tarot. So these archetypes exist all around us in everything that we do. And that's sort of the basis of divination mm. for our dreams and for the tarot and for numerology and for astrology. Um, it's all just kind of tapping into the collective consciousness and uh, reflecting back to us these very common things that we all experience. And that's sort of what helps guide our intuition. And is that what leads us to uh, dream dictionaries? I mean, yeah, those archetypes. Now, I know some people um, are fans of dream dictionaries and some people are not. They say, you know, it's more of an individual thing. How do you how do you use dream dictionaries? Actually, it's it's both. So you will have personal associations with certain dream symbols, and you'll know when you have a very personal association. But because we're all a part of that collective consciousness, those universal archetypes are also going to be present in your dreams. And that's why those dream symbols in the dictionary are going to be relevant, too. And I always tell people, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be one or the other. It can be both. 
you can find that both definitions, your personal association or the other dream dictionary definition, are both accurate in different ways. And they're both sort of giving you more context around what's going on. Is there a dream dictionary that you just really like? So I use dreammoods.com, which is a, a free dream dictionary online. And it it has a lot of symbols in it, but I find that sometimes I'm unable to find a symbol in there. And so there's a book that I like to use um, to sort of supplement it called Dream Dictionary A to Z. And it's interesting because a lot of the dr- dream definitions, dream symbol def- definitions in both of them are like exactly the same verbatim. But then in the book, there will be other things that don't exist in dream mood. So I don't know how or why they ended up having exactly the same definitions. Um, if, I don't know if that person who wrote it worked for dream moods or if these are just universal things that they've pulled from Young himself. But I'm able to find a little more information in that book, too. So I'll use both of them together. Is there a uh, Ashley Riley dream dictionary in your future? Oh, gosh, that would be a hellacious undertaking. <laughs> so, no, never mind. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. You know, I, I, I feel like why reinvent the wheel? Um, I'd rather focus on finding really cool and interesting ways to use those dream dictionaries and the symbols and, and that sort of thing. You say that there's some weird, super weird entries in, in dream dictionaries. You said you've got a few good ones. What are, what are some really weird ones? The, the craziest one. So, you know, my routine every morning is to get up, have my coffee, check my email and write in my dream journal. And I've been doing this for five years. So I'm just like Googling dream symbols. A lot of them I've had, pop up over and over. So I already know what they mean. Um, but occasionally there's a random one that I'm like, Oh, that's different. Let me look that up. And so you just kind of come across random stuff. The weirdest one that I've ever found so far, I was looking up what the meaning of a river was, and I'm going to read this to you verbatim. To dream that a river is comprised of flowing red chili refers to the raw emotion and intense passion or anger that is flowing through you and yearning to be expressed. And I'm just like, (laughs) flowing (laughs) rivers of red chili is common enough to warrant a place in a dream dictionary. (laughs) That I think they need to maybe refer to some other professional advice. (laughs) Maybe perhaps dream dictionary isn't the first place they should go. (laughs) Oh gosh. That's definitely the one that sticks out in my mind is being the WTF (laughs) moment of (laughs) looking up dream symbols. (laughs) But then there's also, you know, the, the typical ones that people think about like teeth falling out and, being naked in public and one that comes to my mind, uh, a memorable one I had, and I know that other people have talked about this is I had a dream where I was be, this is going to sound way worse than it is, but I had a dream that I was being shot and I woke up when I was shot and I was like, that is weird and bizarre. And I don't want to think about it, but, and apparently a lot of people have dreams where they, they die and then they – like this that seemed like the point of the dream was die. And I don't know. I never thought about the past life part of it. Could that Maybe that's even a past life, I guess, which could be weird. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You, you, can, you can have echoes of past life deaths in dreams all the time, especially like check yourself when you wake up and how is this making you feel? You know, if it's kind of just like, eh then there's probably no, you know, past life association to it. But if you are very shaken by that, experiencing, you know, anxiety or intense fear, um, absolutely, I would associate that with a a past life death. I remember the interpretation that I kind of gave myself that next morning because I was kind of, uh, you know, I was jostled a lot by that. And I remember thinking, well, I didn't feel anything. I remember being really afraid. You know, the moment before you get shot, oh my gosh, this is going to hurt, (laughs) as you would imagine. And it didn't. And I remember thinking that didn't hurt. And so I'm like, well, 
is that kind of a lesson for me that, you know, dying, is it going to be painful or? Well, that's a really interesting thing because, you know, if you read some of um, Michael Newton's work or Brian Weiss, where they're doing the, the past life regressions, they go into the moment that people die and, you know, they say that they don't actually necessarily the spirit sort of pops out of the body before they experience any kind of intense pain unless of course that spirit chooses to have that experience that's cool well i distract i i totally went on a tangent so tell us what some give just give us some of the standard kind of typical ones that people look for and what uh your interpretation of them could mean um, being naked in public is definitely a common one for a lot of people. And that 90% of the time revolves around emotional vulnerability, you know, sort of the whole naked soul concept, um, is playing out in a very physical way in your dream and, and you being physically naked. And you want to think about how you feel in regard to that situation in your dream. If you're embarrassed and you're freaking out and you're trying to cover yourself, then that would suggest that you are not comfortable being emotionally vulnerable um, in front of whoever it is that you're in front of in that dream, whether it be the public. You know, if it is the public, then it may be the case that you have this sort of false outer persona and you're not being your real authentic self in front of people. You're not comfortable with that. If it's in front of a specific person, like, for example, your boyfriend or your husband or your wife, you know, it could be that you're not totally emotionally comfortable with being vulnerable in front of them. Whereas if you dream that you're just walking around naked in public and you're like, hey, it's whatever, then, you know, that would just suggest that you are totally comfortable being your authentic self. And a lot of times that happens at school. People talk about being naked at school. And I don't necessarily dream about being naked at school. Thank you, Jesus. But uh, <laughs> Especially since you work at exactly. a school. Exactly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's horrifying. But I do have a lot of dreams where I'm back in one of the schools that I went to growing up. And I don't know, like you just said, I don't know if that's because of my experience as an educator and I kind of am a just a teacher soul or – if it's common to go back to school, you know, in a dream. I think it's pretty common. Um, and it could mean a few different things. Schools to me suggest uh, life lessons. So whatever is occurring in that school setting, it's, it's telling you this is something that you're learning. Um, sometimes going back in time in a dream to like your childhood what it's trying to convey to you is that this is reflective of something that occurred at this time period. So I, I remember having a dream not that long ago where I was I was in school in in a high in a high school setting. Um, except in, in my head, I was like, I'm 19. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm too old to be here. I'm 19. I'm 19. And that dream was indicative of a life event that happened for me when I was 19 that was being reflected back to me in this school setting to let me know that this is a lesson that's revolving around what occurred at that age. I had a cool dream where I went back to my old middle school, which doesn't exist anymore because it's been demolished. It was, it was ancient. It was beautiful. It was huge. And a spirit of a woman and I, I still don't know who this is, led me down one of the, you know, it was, I was in the building kind of in its abandoned state, even though it's not there anymore. And it was dark and I was not really too afraid, but I'm, you know, it's weird because you're chilling, hanging out in an old abandoned school that you remember so well. And I remember her just giving me kind of a message and po she was specifically pointing underneath a stairwell, an old stairwell, which I remember being kind of a creepy corner of the building and the, the, you know, if you think about like 1950s movies of locker rooms and like the gym, I mean, it was kind of in that area. And she pointed to this door underneath the stairwell, this like tiny door, like a half size door. 
Um, and I remember people always talking about how there were tunnels and things underneath our building and I'd never been in them. Some people say they had had to go on in there in a tornado drill or something like that. That's random. But I just remember thinking, God, what's that? I, and it, and it even led me to go to that land, you know, um, a week or two after that. And I, you know, took my nerdy equipment and a recorder and I'm like, okay, hello, I'm here. <laughs> Is there. Is there a message you're giving me or, uh, you know, what's going on? Just curious. And, you know, I didn't get any communication from that. But that's always been a weird school dream that stood out to me. I There's definitely some really clear symbolism there. So so pointing essentially what you're describing is a basement door, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, under kind of a hidden, not meant to be used by general public door. So basements in dreams represent your subconscious mind. Um, Mm. And that represents things that are sort of lurking under the stairs of your your mind that you haven't consciously acknowledged or looked at or brought into your awareness and integrated into your full self. So that would lead me to think that maybe there's something from your time in high school that has affected you that sort of exists underneath the surface there. And she's probably a guide for you. And she's telling you to go and look, you know, look beneath the surface, what's going on. So I don't know what was going on in your life at the time that you had that dream. But a lot of times those sorts of things will pop up when we're experiencing life situations and we're looking for, you know, why, why me, why is this happening to me? What's going on here? Um, you'll, you'll start to figure it out in your dreams. If you pay attention. I sure wish I would, this was a couple of years ago. I sure wish I would have called you after that one. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Ashley has graciously volunteered to do a dream interpretation of a listener today I offered the opportunity to some paranerds in the big seance parlor on Facebook, and Natalia sent in an interesting dream. And so I'm going to go ahead and let you hear Natalia's dream, and then Ashley is going to give us her thoughts on that. So here's Natalia's dream. I had a dream that I was in a house with a group of people from you know modern time like me and this house was old and um colonial looking and we were going to have a battle with these demons or evil entities and there was some kind of like a battle royale feeling to it and nobody in the house had any kind of experience with what we're supposed to do like uh, we have to summon like our own powers in this dream and we all in this room and really not having a clue how to confront these beings. And all of a sudden, uh, uh, you know, it's, they said, well, every time that it becomes hotter, the house becomes hotter, mean they are closer to us and is ready for the battle. So it became hotter and hotter and hotter. And then next thing you know, there is this like group of people and some are, are dressed like in colonial clothing and others are dressed in just, you know, just weird and people. And they were meant to be judges of this battle royale. And um, one of them was this old lady, and she came up to me. And she's like, why? So you look exactly the same way that I saw you last time. And and then I saw her, and I remembered her, but she looked, like, significantly older. And that's as much as I remember of it. I'm sure there was more going on. But I would really appreciate somebody helping me figure it out because it was very real and everything. So thank you. So I want to thank Natalia for sending that in uh, to give us some cool stuff to talk about. And so let's see, let's see how we can help you. See what we can do. What do you think? So I see a lot of really interesting symbolism in there. And, you know, just like I told you before, typically the follow up question that I would ask someone is what was going on in your life at the time that you had that dream? So were you experiencing any sort of major conflicts with another person or a group of people? Um, You know, maybe there was some kind of situation or circumstance that you found yourself in that needed to be overcome because demons in our dreams really represent our own personal demons. 
Um, you know, they represent the issues that we struggle with on a daily basis, whether it's a negative belief that we hold about ourselves or, you know, an attitude or something that we're just really struggling with at that time. It could be an addiction. It could be, you know, anything. And, um, you know, the fact that you're facing this sort of army of demons would suggest that there may have been a lot of conflict happening in your life at that point. I found it really interesting that in, in this dream, you were all meant to summon your own personal power to battle these demons. So, you know, from a spiritual perspective, that's what we're here to do when we incarnate on Earth. Um, we're here to remember where we come from and that we are love and to use that love energy to heal ourselves and the world around us. So that remembering is a sort of stepping into our personal power. And in that sense, this was your higher self's way of letting you know that you have the power to overcome this waking life situation, but you have to find it within yourself. So the things that you feel in a dream, like in this case, heat, a lot of times they're tangible representations of emotions. So just like I was talking about with Patrick earlier about, you know, Walking around naked is a physical representation of emotional vulnerability. Uh, in this instance, heat can be the same thing. So in the ominous setting that you've described, um, the heat could represent hot emotions like anger, shame, embarrassment. Um, it may be that one of the demons you were working through at that time was anger. So I also found the mix of colonial setting and dress with the, the modern times to be a really intriguing sort of symbolism. Um, it would lead me to believe that this is sort of mirroring some kind of behavioral pattern or belief that you may have had in a previous lifetime. And that lifetime could have been in a colonial setting and that's what it was there to clue you into. Especially when you talked about the woman. I, I got this feeling that there was a past life connection and sort of a guide vibe there. Um, a lot of times, people who are guides in spirit while we're in this life were actually people that we shared a past life physical incarnation with. And so they, they may appear to you in your dreams, in their guide form, as their previous self from that past life. So the fact that she was a judge suggests to me that she's there to monitor your progress in this aspect of personal development that this dream is reflecting back to you. I, I wondered about past life stuff with that as she was uh, talking about it and, and, and seeing someone who, if I understand her, someone who she knew in the dream, but not in her awake state, she didn't really know who it was. Is that how you kind of understood that? Yes. And that that is typically an indicator that it is a past life dream. Um, the, the, the period setting is, an, is a tip off. And the fact that there is this person that she recognized in the dream, but does not know in waking life. That's awesome. Uh, I hope that helps, Natalia, by the way. I, I'm going to reach out to Natalia and actually see if she if she has any kind of reflection or responses to that. The part that really resonated with me was the old lady, because um, I remember just seeing the way she looked, um, her face exactly. I mean, it's, you can be walking down the street and see this person, uh, her, even her smell and what she was saying to me and in the dream, it was almost like I could look back to when I met her. So that was probably one of the things that really surprised me. And I remember her clearly. And so I don't know who she is, but it was almost as I could recognize her for some reason. And as she was short and everything and stressed and, you know, like kind of like old lady pantsuit and jacket with like a pin on her lapel. So, yeah, about past lives, I actually had some past life regressions, but I've been a man on my last well, one of my lives anyway. The part about the demons, I am one of those people that worries about everything and always have to have a plan for everything. And I think it comes from uh, 10 years in the military. And uh, so I'm very particular. I have to have everything under control. So I think sometimes 
you know, my demons might, might come to haunt me when I'm not performing in a, in a certain way that I think is more efficient. It's probably the whole military thing and was a drill sergeant for a few years also. So I think that's probably why. And yes, it keeps me awake and at night sometimes. But um, it was a really cool ex experience to remember it because I usually cannot remember my dreams. And um, one of the parts I forgot to say is that I was kind of like leading this group. But at the same time, we none of us had any clue of what we're doing. So that was also a feeling of like, man, like, and we have to work as a team. But very interested. And I thank you so much for the insight. It's very cool to have somebody uh, explain to you some of the things that you have in your head. Um, well, thank you so much for everybody listening. And thank you so much, Patrick and Ash, for doing this for me. Thank you. Bye. So, Ashley, you've got your, we've talked a little bit about your course in dreaming. And tell us anything else that we need to know about that and how people can find that and anything else that you want to, you know, this is the kind of promote away part of the show and where people can find you. I know you are on social media, so let us know anything else that we need to know about Ashley Riley and in my sacred space and dreaming. Yeah. You know, it, I didn't expect us to focus so much on the past life aspects of dreams in this, in this podcast, but I do have a free ebook on, I actually have two on my website. Both are related to dreaming. One is um, a how-to guide on meeting your spirit guides in your dreams. And the other is a how-to guide on um, exploring your past lives through your dreams. And they're, they're really short, quick reads. I include some of those um, dreaming prompts that we talked about earlier, setting your intention for your dream, et cetera. And so you can find those on my website. Um, they're mostly attached to my blogs about reincarnation and or uh, dream interpretation and spirit guides. So if you just kind of browse through my blog um, under those categories, you'll find those to download. And then the dream course itself, it's really, you know, a lot of the stuff that we touched on in this in this interview is packed into this course. It's a work at your own pace sort of thing. There's five different lesson modules. They include video, they include transcripts, workbooks, worksheets, uh, informational guides, links to other reading material, exercises, pretty much everything that you would ever need to kind of get the basic fundamentals of dream interpretation. Um, are available to you in this course. And then in addition to that, you also get access to a Facebook group of all the other students and myself so that you can practice your dream interpretation skills with other students' dreams and ask me any questions, have one-on-one -on -one discussions, and any um, cool new material that I come out with that's relevant will be posted there for you to have access to as well. And so each, uh, each module gets sent out um, every seven days until they're all finished and you can kind of work at your own pace. And hopefully by the end of it, you will come out feeling like you have everything you need to know about tapping into your own intuition via your dreams, meeting your spirit guides, um, knowing how to dream with intention. And, uh, you know, I may be may end up doing a, a second level course later on on dream walking and astral travel and uh, lucid dreaming and that sort of thing. Um, but it took me six months to put this one together. So it'll probably be a little while before I can get that one out. But that means it's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. And I do have to say that quite a few listeners are members of the Big Seance Parlor, my group on Facebook. And if if you're into, you know, finding those cool communities online or on Facebook, along with In My Sacred Space, the blog or the site, she has a really cool In My Sacred Space Facebook group, which I've been a part of, I think, since probably day one that you put it together. And so people should definitely reach out to you there and, and see what's going on there. So uh, is, is Facebook, I think, 
Uh, you're probably on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. That's what I've seen on your site. I'm everywhere. You can find me on Pinterest. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook, Google+. Plus. All of it is in my sacred space, one word. But all those links are also located on my blog. So if you just go to my website, inmysacredspace.com, you can find all of those social media links there. Well, Ashley, you rock. You were, as I said, one of the first people that I connected with on this nerdy journey of mine. And you've been so helpful. And I've enjoyed our friendship, even though really we're just, we still haven't technically met, but this is the first time we're really having a, (laughs) you know, face to face discussion. And so I kind of feel like this should have happened a long time ago, but thanks for coming on the show. You rock. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And you know, we can always do it again. (laughs) Yeah, I think we should. You're listening to the Big Seance Podcast with Patrick Keller. Look for us on iTunes and be sure to check out BigSeance.com for more discussion. Welcome to Spectral Edition. I'm Tim Prossel. I was thinking about when I first became interested in ghosts, and I'm sure it was when I was a boy growing up about 50 miles out of Chicago. It's an area where you've almost certainly heard the story of Resurrection Mary, one of the most popular hitchhiking ghost stories in the United States. Very quickly, the story is of a young woman who passed away, but that doesn't stop her from wanting to go dancing. So her ghost hitches rides with young men. They drive for a while. I think in some versions they actually go dancing. But at some point in the evening, Mary vanishes and the poor guy driving her realizes she was a ghost. I've got a ghost report here that called that to mind for some reason. I think it's because it's about a young woman who lost her life, but her ghost lingers, and it's also set in Illinois. It was published in the Democratic Northwest in Henry County News from Napoleon, Ohio, printed on October 18th of 1894. The headline is, The Girl in White, Mysterious Disappearance of Lizzie Clark 20 Years Ago, The Tragedy of a Little Illinois Town, Murder or Suicide, The Ghost That is Seen by Hunters and Rivermen. It is always arrayed in a white gown. Fully 20 years have passed since Lizzie Clark, an orphan with a heritage, disappeared from a hotel in Dallas City, Illinois, as completely as if the earth had swallowed her up. In all that western country, there has never been a stranger case than the disappearance of that girl, and there has never been a greater ghost mystery than has been and still is occasioned by the evidently disembodied spirit of the girl. The story of Lizzie Clark has been county history. She was an orphan and had some property and money. A guardian had been appointed, and Lizzie, being ambitious to add to her little store, set about to work in a hotel hard by the river's edge. Through the dining room of this hotel runs the line between Hancock and Henderson counties, so that often a guest reached from Hancock into Henderson County when after butter. A country swain and his lass, if seated opposite each other at this board, are in different counties. Many a man wanted for some offense in Hancock County has sat at this table in Henderson County and grinned at the sheriff of Hancock County. It was one afternoon, about twenty years ago, that Lizzie Clark, who had been washing dishes in the kitchen, stepped out into the yard of the hotel. She was seen to leave the kitchen by several working around the house, who paid no attention to the girl, but that was the last ever seen of her. Those who saw her step out into the yard heard no scream, no stifled moan, no struggling, but there are people yet living who believe that the girl was suddenly seized, strangled, concealed in the house until dark, and then cast into the dark river. Be that as it may, the murderers, if they remained in the same locality long, have been amply tormented since. It is said that the murderers did not leave the locality for some time thereafter, and yet again others say the girl was never murdered, but drowned herself, and that her ghost is not one of a murdered person's, but one of a suicide. All one can gain from the different stories and theories is that the girl was dealt with foully in some manner, and that her ghost still haunts the locality. 
Of course, every effort was made to ferret out the mystery. Detectives hunted high and low, money was spent to no purpose, and finally the guardian of the girl's estate turned her money and property over to the county authorities, in whose hand it remains to this day because there is no kith or kin to claim it. The girl's ghost was first seen in December 1887, when a party of duck hunters were returning to Dallas City from the islands. An excursion steamer had become disabled late in the season and was lying on the bank of the island across the bay. She was in a rather bad fix. It was expected to leave her there during the winter. As the hunters neared the craft, a form in white was seen to run out upon the upper deck. It was a young girl's figure, and she was evidently being pursued, for from across the water came screams, and then the following words, Leave me alone! Leave me alone, or I will drown myself! With that, the specter flung itself into the river. There was a splash, and the cold waters closed over the white body. Several times during that winter, the ghost of Lizzie Clark was seen at night, and at early candlelight around the disabled steamer. When the steamer was taken away the next spring, workmen and steamboatmen heard pitiful screams from the willows on shore as the boat moved away. The spirit did not leave the island, and it is believed now that she was buried on the island after the murder. Of later years, however, the girl's ghost has been seen in a skiff at night, and it was only a few evenings ago that one of the St. Louis and St. Paul fast steamers ran into the spectral thing. The pilot did not see the ghostly craft until too late. He says he saw a boat of white that looked more like floating fleece than anything else. In the boat was a young girl in white raiment, but there were blood clots on the white dress. She was rowing swiftly. When the prow of the steamer struck this frail craft, it cut through it like mist. The ghostly occupant only laughed, a sort of uncanny laugh, a half-scream, and when we had passed I saw the spectral craft dancing on the waves behind. I doubt if any ordinary skiff could have lived in the waves of our steamer right under the paddles. Thus spoke the pilot, and he is a man of few words and sterling integrity. Have you seen Lizzie Clark's boat? Is now the question that goes from one month to another during the summer season. The question is not asked so often in winter from the fact that the poor girl's spirit does not seem to roam so much. Hunters have come into Dallas shaking with fright and calling for a dram to brace their nerves, saying that while coming down from the islands above the ice, they had met Lizzie Clark walking rapidly toward them. She always wears that white dress, and the blood stains on the neck are plain. The girl's eyes are always staring wide open, as if she were being suffocated. Her spirit has been known to step out from behind a clump of dead trees at the head of the island and face passers-by. She will give them a terrible look, and then scream piteously. In an instant more, the spirit has disappeared. That's a story that I believe is ready-made for Hollywood. I'm Tim Prossel, and you've been listening to Spectral Edition. I have more than 300 of these ghost articles, and I publish one each Wednesday on my website. The website is called The Merry Ghost Hunter, M-E-R-R-Y. I hope you stop by. Thanks for joining us for the Big Seance Podcast. We'd better get back to the table while there's still some candlelight left. We only have one spectral edition left in Tim's series. Can you believe it? But I promise to have him on as a guest real soon, because I hear he has some cool projects up his sleeve. Recently, I had the honor of being a guest on episode 152 of Sandra Champlain's We Don't Die radio show. Sandra's had some very notable guests on her show, so I was excited to be on. And of course, I think I increased the nerd factor of her show just a bit. So check that out. And while you're at it, you might be interested in her great book. And it shares the same name as her show, actually. We Don't Die. I read it several years ago. I'll link you to the episode and the book in the show notes at BigSeance.com. Thank you, Sandra. I'll be back in two weeks with an animal communicator named Crystal Hope Reed. Only we're not talking about animal communication. 
We'll be talking about her cool new book that's not about being psychic, but how to live with the psychic. You won't want to miss it. Well, here's your Paranerd hashtag. Tweet me at Big Seance and include Ashley Riley at In My Sacred Space and use the hashtag Dream Course. That's D R E A M C O U R S E. So again, tweet at Big Seance and at In My Sacred Space with hashtag Dream Course. All one word. Well, I'm blowing the candles out. See you in two weeks. For show notes, including links to anything we may have mentioned in this episode, visit BigSeance.com. Just click on the Big Seance Podcast logo or find it in the menu. You can also find and subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, TuneIn Radio, and iHeartRadio. Do you have any comments or feedback? Go to BigSeance.com slash feedback to learn how to get your voice in a future show. Or you can call my feedback line, 7755-TELL-ME. That's 775-583-5563. Interested in learning how to promote and share the podcast? Go to BigSeance.com slash share. Thank you so much for listening. Unfortunately, it's time to blow the candles out, but we'll see you and light them again next time.